30 years since the world watched Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat shake hands on a framework for peace talks, why does the dream of a two-state solution seem further away than ever before? In Europe, nurses and doctors are planning new industrial action and we have new data to understand what nurses are actually paid across the region. What is the impact of governments taking short-sighted approaches to solving deep-rooted problems in health systems? And in South Korea, rail workers are on a four-day strike following a breakdown in negotiations. The first such strike since 2019. Why is management and the government failing to respond? This is, of course, Daily Debrief. And if you like the kind of coverage we do of the news beyond the headlines, don't forget, of course, to like and subscribe as well as share this video with your friends. We are coming to you, as always, from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani. On September the 13th, 1993, two adversaries shook hands and the world watched with hope. Hope of talks, of a framework and of moves towards a two-state solution in Palestine. Thirty years on, that dream seems further away than ever before. But the hope of the Palestinian people continues to find new ways to reinvigorate their struggle for a homeland. The Oslo Accords, which was a framework for talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, mediated, of course, by American diplomats, have turned 30. On Daily Debrief, we've consistently reported on the conditions in which Palestinians continue to live and work and fight and struggle, of course, in the occupied territories. And today, we have the opportunity to talk to Dr. Abdul Rahman about some of the historical details as well as the future of the resistance. Let's go over to him now. Abdul, 30 years on, uh, it might be a diffi bit difficult to recap that entire history. Uh, but give us your take on where the Oslo uh, framework, the Oslo Accords framework uh, stands today. How has it been violated? And, and also maybe give us some context into whether the sort of development of this framework was a, in, a, in a way uh, doomed to fail anyway. Oslo Accord, which was signed in 93-94, uh, 30 years back, one can safely say that it has been never implemented. All its provisions, uh, starting from the creation of Palestinian Authority, the uh, demarcation of three different regions within the occupied West Bank, uh, the, uh, the, the number of settlements, all of these have been consistently violated. Palestinian Authority has been deprived of all basic rights, which is necessary to basically govern whatever limited government, uh, governance right it was uh, uh, assumed to have. Um, when it comes to the number of settlements, we everyone knows that Israel, successive governments of Israel have never followed uh, the control, uh, never even tried to control the uh, expansion of settlements. And uh, today, around 700,000 uh, illegal settlers live all across occupied West Bank and uh, occupied in occupied uh, East Jerusalem. When it, it, when it comes to uh, final status negotiations, it has been 30 years. None of uh, the, uh, uh, the issues have even been initiated. Uh, we, we know that uh, Israel has basically tried to uh, assert its sovereignty over uh, Eastern Jerusalem and in fact one of the guarantors of the Oslo Agreement, the United States during Trump administration recognized, uh, 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 in fact shifted its embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, it has basically, uh, Israel has built a kilometer, hundreds of kilometers of wall separating the Palestinians and the uh, rest of the uh, uh, territories in occupied West Bank, which basically uh, violates the basic right of uh, movement, uh, right to uh, work, right to health of all the Palestinians. Uh, the number of Palestinians being killed uh, in the aggression, not only carried by the uh, Israeli armed forces, but also by the illegal settlers living within 
the occupied territories um, ha has increased and in increasing every day there has been no attempt to address the issues related to the Palestinian refugees. In fact, if you see the uh, Israel's, because of the policies of uh, settlement expansion and because of the policies of uh, forceful dis displacement, the number of Palestinian refugees who were basically uh, twice the victims have also increased. The entire occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem has become Bantustan, which basically makes it impossible for Palestinian Authority to carry out even the basic minimum work. And uh, apart from preventing people from their, uh, carrying out their, their normal day-to-day -day life. So given the, the extent to which Israel has basically um, cracked down on the pa Palestinian people, has basically violated their basic rights, one can, uh, I think, one can safely conclude that the Oslo uh, agreements are dead and they were they have never been in fact observed so given all of that abdul and uh, of course all of the other conversations we've had on uh, the subject of palestine uh, across the course of our reportage on daily debrief uh, the sort of lack of viability of of this framework where does that leave the palestinian resistance and how do you look at uh, the resistance sort of growing or where do you look at it going in the future when it comes to alternatives uh, in front of the Palestinian resistant groups, uh, we all know that uh, a large number of the Palestinian groups, including Hamas and Islamic Jihad, had never accepted the legitimacy of uh, the Oslo Agreement. And they had basically, uh, for a very long time, believed in the armed resistance. And uh, they also indulged in it for a very long time. Though in recent years, they have also realized that this may not lead to the desired uh, uh, results. And uh, uh, so uh, there is, by, by and large, there is a consensus now, at least among the Palestinian groups, main Palestinian resistance group, about uh, finding uh, a, a political solution to the Palestinian issue. And therefore, they believed that some kind of internationally negotiated, mediated, peace process is the only viable option. However, the Palestine, there is a group of Palestinian uh, youth which basically is completely disillusioned with all these traditional uh, resistant groups and they have basically tried to uh, look for an alternative. Some of them have uh, adopted violent methods also. Uh, if you see in last few uh, months, uh, there have been many, several attacks on the uh, Israeli occupation forces, uh, inside Israel and so on and so forth, which, which, which reminds us of what happened during the first intifada or the second, in, at least second intifada. So that is one option also. There is, of course, there is a third option and which is, which has caught the imagination of a large number of movements across the globe at this moment is the BDS movement, which by court divestment sanction movement, which basically uh, has been able to convince at least not the governments but at least some of the uh, movements in uh, in the first world countries in europe us elsewhere where they have been basically uh, uh, convinced that it is necessary that the world adopts similar methods uh, uh, as they adopted during the apartheid regime in south africa to pressurize israel to basically come and sit on a table to negotiate the solution uh, uh, for the Palestinian issue. So uh, that is another uh, option. Within that, there is a small group which also believes that two-state solution is no more viable and therefore we should work for a, a one-state solution in which uh, the Palestinians can live within Israel as equal citizens. Though even there is a strong uh, disagreement among the majority of the Palestinian groups uh, over the, the viability of this one state solution. But nonetheless, that is uh, one of the options which the Palestinian resistance groups have started exploring. So um, uh, in the absence of uh, any uh, uh, possibility that Oslo, Oslo agreements will be implemented, uh, the only options remain is uh, that uh, uh, the world rethinks 
and, and particularly given the larger changes in the geopolitics at the global level, rethinks about finding solution to Palestinian issue and basically to kind of work harder for uh, achieving, uh, uh, starting some kind of peace process. So uh, that is the only option uh, uh, which looks viable at this moment. Well, that's all we have time for uh, today, Abdul. So we'll uh, leave it there. Thanks very much for the update. Right, new data has revealed the massive gaps in pay received by nurses working in various nations across the European region. This data comes at a time when health professionals, including but of course not limited to doctors and nurses, have been forced to take industrial action in the United Kingdom as well as in mainland Europe. They are demanding better wages, of course, but also better work conditions and higher staffing levels. It also comes at a time when all working people are struggling to deal with the rising costs of staying alive and paying for even a basic basket of goods. To talk about uh, these wages in real terms, of course, in terms of what they can buy and what they cannot, and about how governments in Europe are looking to solve the issues, Anna Vrachar of the People's Health Movement joins us from Zagreb. Anna, good to have you uh, on Daily Debrief. As always, I haven't seen you in a while. Also, hope you're uh, well. Uh, first up, I wanted to talk to you about the latest round of action by UK nurses uh, coming as it does on the wake of this uh, release or this understanding that we now have of relative pay scales of nurses across Europe. Uh, yeah, so essentially, you know, uh, if we focus on the UK for now, uh, we can say that it's already been uh, almost a year since health workers there uh, have started uh, doing uh, different kinds of campaigns, including extensive industrial action over the over the level of, the, of their, uh, their salaries. So this week, uh, there have been scattered strikes among different health workers uh, in different in different hospitals uh, uh, of England. And then later uh, this month and later in October, we're also looking uh, at something that uh, apparently has never happened before, and that's a joint strike by junior doctors and resident doctors. Uh, so the health workers, instead of, you know, stepping back from the action that uh, they began because they were warning the, the government from the very beginning that uh, the salary levers were not enough to keep up with the cost of living crisis with the inflation that uh, that the UK uh, people have been struggling so uh, so much with mm. they're actually stepping up uh, and uh, keeping tight on what they have started um, but yes, as you, as you mentioned, uh, this is not something that's uh, specific to to England. Uh, it's uh, the level of salaries uh, and essentially uh, the extent to which the salaries uh, that health workers receive are uh, enough uh, to secure a living uh, is a problem that's uh, widespread all over Europe. Uh, mm. And just recently we've seen updated data about the amount, uh, so both the comprehensive amounts of salaries which are received by nurses in different countries of Europe, uh, but also of um, of those salaries adjusted for, for purchasing power um, parity. So, right, you know, which uh, becomes critical actually. Yeah, yeah. In, in this situation, it's actually something that, that's missing from the conversation because as we've, uh, as we've heard from the various governments, you know, uh, everybody's saying, oh, but uh, the health workers who are now on strike have actually got a pay raise in the last two or three or four years. Mm. But if you look at the numbers adjusted uh, for some, and including the UK, uh, it's actually a pay cut. So these new uh, this new da data shows that um, what the nurses in the UK have experienced is essentially a 6% six, uh, 6 cut uh, to, uh, to what they had before. Uh, and of course, in the context uh, that Europe is uh, is living right now, uh, which includes uh, a very high increase in uh, in prices, uh, in utilities uh, for, for utilities for food and for other uh, basic necessities. Yeah, Ad adjusting the salaries to actually uh, be uh, you know to be able to confront those rising costs is essential. So. Uh, what we're seeing in the UK, but also in other uh, in other countries, is that the go governments are trying to kind of uh, hide away and uh, hide away from what's what's essentially being experienced by the people. Right. Uh, we see also in this data, uh, Anna, which you shared with us, 
quite a massive sort of range of salaries that uh, nurses receive across Europe where, uh, okay, there are of course differences uh, in the region in terms of costs of living and, and essential commodities. Uh, but broadly speaking, there is there is some sort of common set of denominators that uh, kind of determine the, the price of your basket of essential goods, uh, I guess. And, and like 10 times uh, in some cases, uh, these salaries uh, kind of vary. How, how do you kind of factor that in? Are nurses and other professionals anywhere in Europe uh, getting paid enough, basically speaking, to earn a decent living? Okay, so uh, that's actually a good question. I wouldn't rule it out that in some places, but very few places, mm. uh, the nurses are getting paid uh, enough to make a living. Uh, so, but you know, those are very rare places, and it's like uh, it's it's uncommon to to see that. For example, Luxembourg would be one of those places. Right. But if you look at the the you know the overall salary that they're getting in in Luxembourg, uh, it's over one hundred thousand uh, euros. Uh, per year so that's that's exceptionally high uh, and of course you know everything in, in Luxembourg is exceptionally uh, disproportionate to to the rest of Europe so um, I wouldn't take it as a rule uh, mm. in most places what we're seeing is that uh, the salary that you get is not really enough to uh, you know to take you to the end of the month and this is something that's been reported from the ground from nurses from all over the place so starting with Portugal uh, where uh, nurses have also been on strike for the last, uh, so re repeatedly uh, over the past uh, couple of months, uh, because of this kind of uh, disparities and because of some of the promises to uh, essentially recognize uh, their experience and their contribution to the health system were not were not taken uh, were not put into practice. And then, of course, you know, there's a whole other set of people in East Europe, uh, w which, if you look at the data, of course, it's at the bottom of that list. And yeah. I think not not even all of the countries were included on uh, were included in the data set, but were included in the data set. But essentially, um, the prices, although the prices might be lower when you compare them to um, to Central Europe and so on and so on, mm -hmm. uh, the pay that you receive in, for example, Bulgaria, Romania, Lithuania, in the Baltic states, um, you know, it, even in in Croatia and in the in the countries which would uh, be presented like better off in this kind of in this part of in this part of Europe, Europe. Uh, it's n the prices are still too high to essentially, uh, you know, live off that salary that you're getting. So it's uh, in, it's particularly a problem for people who are living alone. Uh, if you have single parents who have to take care of the child, there are um, more costs involved. So essentially the overall picture is that uh, the nurse's salaries are overall too low. Uh, they should be increased. And it's something that should be really put uh, put on the table as uh, as the government discusses how to deal with, uh, with the struggling health systems that they have in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and also so many different questions, I guess, uh, come up because of this, because so many participants in this part of the labor market are uh, migrants themselves. Uh, we've talked before about how uh, skewed it is on, on gender terms and how women face a disproportionate uh, impact of the low levels of wages, etc., particularly when it comes to like single parents or single income households. Uh, I want to talk a bit about because so many of these governments as well as private hospitals and other institutions uh, in Europe are now looking to kind of buy up uh, labor from uh, the global south to make up for their shortfall. Uh, are they deliberately sort of obfuscating from dealing with the issue uh, and looking at actual long-term solutions like you were pointing out towards beleaguered health systems that they are facing and instead just filling short-term gaps by bringing in more migrant workers who are perhaps willing to work for a lower wage? Well, yeah, I would say the the, the second point would be more would be closer to to what's happening. And again, we've been uh, for the last couple of issues of the People's Health Dispatch, we have been reporting and looking at how Germany is dealing with its uh, severe shortage of health workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, just to point out, it's not a German problem; it's an overall problem. Health yeah. workers uh, are missing everywhere, but. 
what the, the German government has been doing for the last the last months and essentially years. But in the last couple of months, we've heard reports that, for example, the German labor minister meets with uh, their counterpart in Brazil, in Kerala, uh, in, in other places which they see as source source places uh, where they can recruit nurses. And the rationale behind this is that they come and say, well, if you look at the numbers, um, you have very high numbers of nursing graduates coming from nursing schools in some states of India, in some parts of Brazil. So it's fair for us to come and offer them, you know, better conditions. They can migrate freely. And that's, you know, it's called a triple win. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, it's a bit of a problematic term because uh, it essentially leaves out this whole uh, problem that when you look at the health systems as, and particularly at the public health systems, uh, they're missing the the health workers themselves. Um, India and Brazil, they're not so well staffed that they can allow themselves to export such high numbers of nurses. It's just that the jobs are not there. The jobs are not there because the money is not there. And essentially what uh, the high income countries governments are doing, they're choosing to ignore all that because, you know, it's it's a bargain for them. You can get uh, nurses training uh, in, in the global south for a fraction of the price that you would need mm. to invest uh, in Germany or in France or in the UK. So it's very cheap if you look at it. Uh, and once they do migrate, it's also very it's cheaper labor force than you would get locally. It's a way of exploiting people. It's a way of also exploiting uh, the education systems and the health systems of source countries, uh, which are investing their own money uh, in in training these nurses and doc doctors and pharmacists and uh, other health workers, uh, and essentially just uh, you know uh, trying to find a, an easy way to a very difficult question. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we, we are out of time. Uh, of course, lot, lots more to discuss on this subject. But uh, through People's Health Dispatches, of course, uh, your perspectives will, are vital, particularly in these parts of the world, I, I guess, which you look at as, as maybe source countries and where these debates are not really happening of, uh, you know, what the real costs are and, and the implications of uh, kind of shipping yourself out to another part to work uh, in the longer run and definitely for governments to look at in terms of how they hope to shape uh, health structures for sure. Thanks very much for joining us. And finally, unionized workers at the government-run Korean Railroad Corporation, also known as CoRail for short, are on a four-day strike. This is the first such industrial action since 2019 and the demands that the government restructure work allocation also deal with understaffing issues, expand the rail network itself, and change the way in which it looks at railroads in general. Uh, Anish covers the region for People's Dispatch. Let's go over to him now. Uh, Anish, uh, welcome back to Daily Debrief, your favorite uh, spot, of course, uh, the, the best bit of work you do all day. Uh, what, what is happening in Korea and, and is there sort of a deadlock in negotiations already between the union uh, and management? Well, the deadlock has been there for a while now. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, statements being made uh, by the KRWU uh, in the past, in many, in the, since at least uh, November, December last year, and uh, the same kind of contentions uh, continue at this point. Uh, and we see at this at this current juncture uh, the government trying to use uh, SR Corporation. Uh, as uh, a pathway to privatizing railways. Now, one of the uh, bit of context that we need to give our audience is basically that SR Corporation uh, is basically one of those, uh, apart from Corel, runs the, uh, you know, the uh, super fast trains, it runs the super fast train uh, category called as SR trains, SRTs, and that uh, basically uh, it's owned by a couple of uh, government run corporations but different, with different shareholdings. And uh, so it's more or less quite easier for them to unbundle that at some level and maybe, uh, you know, publicly trade it, uh, bring in private players. And this has been uh, accused, alleged by uh, unions for quite a while now, uh, because, and they are now demanding a merger of that with uh, Corel, which is a government run subsidiary. Uh, and that uh, pretty much runs most of uh, of uh, Korean railways at this point. But nevertheless, that aside, you also have other uh, issues being raised, uh, primarily uh, surrounding 
working hours in uh, among you know rail operators mm. they're calling for a 12 hour rotational shift uh, di- uh, divided among four teams there and then obviously uh, wage adjustments uh, based on you know the escalating cost of living crisis something that we see very often uh, among uh, trade union movements strikes and you know mobilizations over the past few years now since we have done this show actually we have yeah. talked about the cost of living crisis and korea is no different in that sense uh, and has been affected very badly with uh, we just stagnating almost at some level and so uh, this these are some of the primary demands and we actually see uh, a sort of uh, the political uh, line that uh, the government is using because basically they do want to they they did uh, break down the merger uh, plans for corel and sr corporation uh, earlier this year and uh, it is pretty much that that uh, that has angered much of the workers because they do believe that it would be much more easier and cost effective and also it will be better for the workers as well because uh, it will bring out a significant amount of revenue and they can expand uh, the bullet train uh, network in the country right now Uh, Anish, over the past year or so, we've seen uh, several sort of major incidents involving uh, commuter trains here in India, in Europe as well. Uh, a lot of them, uh, or well, investigations into them, also consider staffing, uh, particularly of those manning critical parts of the rail networks, uh, as a, s- a serious issue, and and this seems to be across the globe. So. uh in the context of south korea what is the government's take on it and uh, sort of why is there continuing willingness to understaff what is a uh, critical service and that actually impacts lives staffing has been primary uh, issue in this country and that is also reflected in the 12 hour uh, four uh, four team workshops that we are calling for Uh, and this is primary, and also the calls for merger because this will uh, streamline the entire network, the existing network, uh, bring in a better level of staffing. It can actually address staffing shortages at this point, and also uh, you know uh, consolidate revenue and profits as well of the two corporations, and that can actually help the railways to expand. But that is necessarily not what the government. uh wants at the moment and we must remember that this uh, union the PRWU is pretty much uh, dominated by uh, the FKTU which is basically the Federation of Korean Trade Unions uh, uh, a trade union that was established during the military regime era and uh, military dictatorship era and it was supposed to be this very pro employer uh, company union kind of uh, trade union and it is part of this like the the PRWU is basically primarily uh, it dominated and you know the, even the leadership was dominated by the fkpu and despite that uh, you know a trade union that is considered a uh, very pro conservative are making demands that are that are going against government's policies at the uh, current point of time uh, it clearly shows that there is a, a clear divide between the workers and the government at this point which is not nec- it's not entirely irre- uh, you know irreparable uh, it is just something that uh, requires a lot of uh, you know good faith uh, work and also uh, you know the willingness of the government to actually expand uh, and you know invest in the railways a very critical infrastructure and uh, that is something that we do not see forthcoming in the government right now all right any thanks very much for that update we'll leave it there for today That's all we have on this episode of the show as always we take this opportunity to invite you to head to our website peoplesdispatch.org for details on these stories of course but all of the other work we do as well uh, don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice for regular updates we'll be back same time same place tomorrow with another show until then stay safe thank you for watching goodbye